R.W. Johnson is uh, much appreciated by the Biz News community. And this week, uh, we've had the privilege of publishing two pieces. We're going to be talking to him about both of those. The one is the Arms to Russia scandal. And the second one, which is um, in the works of being published still, is the ANC's recent decisions, which look pretty crazy, but then again, consistent with an organization that's towards the end of its time. We'll find out more about that in a moment. Mr. Johnson, always great talking with you, uh, especially, I guess, this week, because we've got two topics to pick up on. Let's start with the first of them, the arms to Russia scandal, which you've articulated really well for us. But now the fact that a commission of inquiry has been established, but it's not going to be disclosed, uh, what comes out of that commission of inquiry seems to make it all rather strange. Is this the normal process of a government, that they would establish a commission of inquiry, but then keep the answers to themselves? No, it's very, very unusual. Uh, And after all, this arose because John Steenhazen brought the matter up on the floor of the House with Ramaphosa there, and Ramaphosa came up with this judicial inquiry as a way to sort of deflect the DA, and everyone at that point assumed it meant in time you will get your answer. Uh, Had he replied to him then, we're going to have an inquiry, but we won't tell you what it says and it'll remain a secret, and that would certainly not have gone down at all. Uh, Look, I mean, there is a constitutional requirement for the executive to treat Parliament with respect. Parliament cannot do its job if on matters of great national importance like this, if it's simply not allowed to know the facts. And it's grotesque to claim that this has got to be secret. Uh, I mean, the whole world has been talking about it, and uh, it's been battered around diplomatically and so on. The idea that now this can somehow be turned into a secret again is ridiculous. And it's also, as I I pointed out, in a sense, it's tantamount to an admission of guilt. We all know that if the truth was that they really hadn't uh, broken any of the rules by the way they treated the Lady R, they would be shouting it from the rooftops. They certainly wouldn't be keeping it secret. So... The implication is pretty clear. Well, then the consequences must be pretty concerning as well. The governor of the Reserve Bank, Lesetje Kanyaho, has in Parliament, he told Parliament yesterday, that it appears as though investment markets are preparing for sanctions, at least secondary level sanctions, to be leveled against South Africa as a consequence of all of this. Is this, uh, the implications of this being exaggerated? Well, I I think that's probably putting it a bit too strongly. I know he put it rather like that. But uh, the people I've spoken to in the financial business world say that it's as if investors, and of course from uh, the governor's point of view also lenders, um, they are acting without waiting to hear anymore. Uh, and really rather on a moral basis, um, people who were thinking of investing here or putting money in in one way or the other have said, well, look, I'm not interested in doing that uh, if this is a country which is going to embrace Vladimir Putin. Putin's a menace, he's a war criminal, he's all these things, and uh, I simply want nothing to do with it. And clearly the same attitude seems to be uh, held by the organizers of Formula One have pulled that race as well. And I think that's the point, really, that uh, a lot of people simply won't wait for anything further. They've already seen what they've seen, and that's enough for them. And the the damage is done to some extent. The Formula One decision is something that uh, we are very well plugged into, and it was a direct consequence of the, uh, the, the decision to give immunity to Putin. And yet there's conflicting signals here within South Africa. Well, the Formula One, that that boat has sailed. 
But there's conflicting reports here in South Africa that even if the government wants to do this, our laws don't allow it, that the constitution will stop it. And as a consequence, they're going to have to do something different anyway. You, you, when you look at all of this confusion, you wonder, uh, which brings us to, to your second column, you wonder what the ANC is thinking right now, or if it is thinking. Well, it's difficult to know, and I'm sure different parts of it are thinking different things. Uh, one of the problems, I mean, we see from the morning papers that it sounds like they're beginning to get cold feet and there's talk about a summit being moved to China and so on. Well, I think if Ramaphosa does that, he will face a tremendous backlash within the ANC because certainly the SACP and certain other elements there You'll find this as a, a, a sort of backing down to the Americans. They won't like it. Uh, and the problem is he's come out too publicly one way, and if he's now going to back the other way, then uh, it's not going to look good. Had he taken a more non-aligned stance in the beginning, it would all have been very easy and smooth. And, I mean, it's worth pointing out that Lavrov, the uh, Russian foreign minister, has just been spending a lot of time trying to establish good relations with Kenya. Now, Kenya, of course, is a very significant country, uh, but it came out with perhaps the strongest statement against the Russian invasion of any African country. Uh, and obviously, that hasn't really phased the Russians at all. They're still keen to befriend them. Uh, so, I mean, we could have taken that line, and I don't think it would have spoiled anything. You know, it would have been just the normal thing that a UN member would do is to say, you can't invade other countries and trespass on their territorial integrity. It's just, you know, uh, we all sign the charter. Uh, that's what we stand by. Uh, no one can really get angry about that. But unfortunately, uh, Ramaphosa, I think without realizing the implication, started off down this road and is now going to back away a bit. But the problem he's got is, first of all, the Russians have said that they, it's unacceptable to them for Putin to appear only virtually. Chairman Xi of China has made it clear that if Putin's not invited, he won't come. So, in effect, if Putin is not invited, then the summit collapses, unless it's moved to another country, uh, which is why I think they're talking about China. But again, you see, the implication for South Africa is not very good because if they're a BRICS member which cannot host a BRICS summit, then I don't know what their chances would be of ever again being offered one, uh, you know, after this. Uh, so they, they really have made quite a mess out of this. Why? Well, because I think, as I say, they started down the road that they did without realizing the full implications of it. And as those have become clear, they've got into a bit of a panic, and so they're going into reverse, and so they're getting the worst of both worlds. That's what happens when you don't know, you know, if you're taking a good firm line one way or the other, you could have stuck by that. But it appears as though somewhere along the line, the advice that's being given or the thought processes are not very clear. I think that's right. I think that, uh, as I say, I don't, I, I doubt that Ramaphosa understood what he was getting into when he first countermanded uh, the Lady Pandor statement, which, frankly, if she'd made that statement, we would have just been one more out of more than 100 countries saying the same thing. Nobody would have batted an eyelid. It would have seemed perfectly normal. And I don't think the Russians would have got upset about it. It would have just been what many, many others, the majority of African states were doing anyway. So there's a big mess with the BRICS summit, which is scheduled for mid-August. But within the lawmaking in South Africa, as you point out in your second column, there's quite a lot of mess going on as well. Uh, the decision or the, the, the obsession with trying to push through the national health insurance or national health in South Africa when it's the country doesn't have the money for it. Seems rather strange. Are they just playing politics? Well, that's what they've been doing with NHI for more than a decade now. That is to say, claiming that they're pushing it, coming out with 
plans for it and even bills, but never coming up with a plan as to how to finance it. And even the bill they've just passed has no provision about that at all. And, you know, there the, is this airy assumption that all the money that's going into private medical aid at the moment will be diverted to help fund NHI. But it's very difficult to see why that should be so. If you simply tell everybody who is paying a lot of money every month that they can no longer have private health care, well, then they will stop paying, full stop. They'll presumably then try to make private deals with doctors and pay them directly. But there's no way they're just going to hand all that money over to the state for NHI. I mean, I don't know. This is a peculiar assumption to me. I don't know how they come up with that. But the point is that the Treasury has clearly never believed in NHI and has never, you know, encouraged it. Uh, so there's never any proposal as to how they're going to fund it. And uh, the truth is that any proposal they might come up with would be so ruinous financially that it would have to be shot down by Treasury. And now, of course, uh, it, they've more or less promised they're going to bring out some sort of basic income grant, which they can't afford. But if they do that, then that really does kill off NHI because there won't be any money at all left for that sort of thing. Then. It, it confuses me sometimes when I sit in the budget and the mini budget uh, twice, well, twice a year uh, that South Africa is still overspending. Uh, we, we seem to believe that as long as we have what is called a primary surplus, uh, that we don't, that the, the expenditure is not greater than income excluding interest, which is 18% of the budget, that everything's fine, that we're actually moving in the right direction. But we're going backwards by 18% a year. It's almost an, a, an inability to grasp the nettle in South Africa on the financial side, which is now being very apparent in other parts of the country as well. Yet the electorate seems at this stage to not really be paying the kind of attention that that one might expect. Yeah, well, I think that they've got used to the notion that public servants tend to get inflation plus settlements because it's been going on forever. Now, that's just happened all over again. What happens each time is that the Treasury draws up a budget which assumes that they're going to observe financial discipline. And then before very long, they make a very generous settlement with the public servants, which they've just done again. Now, they can't afford that. And on top of that, we've seen figures in the last month showing that in the private sector, which is the bulk of the economy, that monthly wages have actually been dropping. So the fact that public servants have just got a 7.5% increase, inflation plus again, means that the gap between the public and private sector is just getting wider and wider, which is ridiculous, really, because after all, at the end of the day, the private sector has to be profitable because it, that is how you fund the public sector. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to, to have this uh, reverse situation. But look, the point I th that you're making, of course, is a more fundamental one, which is that we have a national debt of almost 75% of GDP. And we're running a fiscal deficit of around 6%. So that will tend to push things up again. Uh, I mean, year on year, this is happening. Now, the Treasury has said that they're going to level off. They'll never allow uh, debt to get into the 80%. So they're going to cut it short in the 70s. Uh, the IMF this morning came out with a prediction that within seven years, South Africa's debt will be 85% of GDP and say, you really have to get this back down to between 60 and 70. Uh, and even that is quite high for a developing country. I mean, 60 is preferable. And I think the trouble is that in order to do that, you would either have to just give up entirely on NHI, basic income grant. You would also have to stop having these large public sector uh, settlements, you really would have to have a couple of years of zero increase. 
and you simply cannot keep on increasing social grants. Uh, it's, it's a huge thing, and at the same time, of course, as you say, the very big interest bill, which is they can't do much about. So, you know, the, the truth is that if you're going to get the debt down, you're going to have to take some very tough decisions. We spoke earlier this week with Professor William Gomede, who says that South Africans should get angry. We're not angry enough at the misgovernance uh, that is happening in this country. Is that a, a, a forlorn hope of his? Are South Africans ever going to get angry enough to get this government back on track or indeed change it? Well, I, I think two sorts of things here. One is that a lot of people, certainly a lot of people I know, are effectively punch drunk. They've just had such a flood of difficult or bad news over quite a long period that uh, they're weary. Uh, and it's not that they're not fed up with it or angry about it, but they can't be in a state of angry hysteria all the time. They've got to get on with their lives as well. Look, the anger that matters is, frankly, in the townships and the informal settlement, uh, where there is indeed a lot of anger. People are very disappointed, very fed up. And I, I was talking to someone just yesterday uh, who does live in, or actually in part of Soweto, and they were saying, you know, that uh, people are burning tires, it feels like we're back to apartheid days, that... Um, same sort of tension in the township. People very, very angry about the power cuts. And now, of course, worrying about water as well. And I think the sense of anger and disappointment there, that is politically potent. Uh, you know, that really is. And uh, the ANC is going to have to do something about that before the election. When we go back a few years to your book, How Long Can South Africa Survive? At the time, it appeared as though by by now uh, we would have been at with a begging bowl at the International Monetary Fund. What is your time span now, or indeed, can South Africa survive without having to ask others for help? Well, what happened was two things, both of them very good slices of luck. One was a commodity boom, uh, which meant that suddenly all the mines were earning a great deal more money and paying a great deal more tax, and that let the pressure off uh, the Treasury for a couple of years, actually. But secondly, there was a revision of GDP uh, saying that actually our GDP was 11% bigger uh, than we thought, and of course that had the effect of shrinking the debt as a proportion. So both of those things put the clock back on the debt, but it's been creeping up again, as you rightly say. I think really now that well, it's what we've just been talking about, that, you know, a, a country like this cannot really afford to get up to the 85% uh, figure that the IMF talks about. Uh, it would probably mean that interest payments would be over a quarter of the budget uh, by then, maybe even more. Uh, and you get to the point where repayment becomes almost lacking in credibility. So... You know, it's in that next period ahead uh, of the next five, seven years that the, these questions are going to get answered. Either then the, the government really will pull back hard and Godongwana looks like he would like to, but he hasn't managed to do it so far. And in fact, we're still running budget deficits, uh, which keep on pushing the debt up. But it's a slow process because of those two corrections, which put the clock back, as I say. And just to close off with Mr. Johnson, the ANC-EFF alliance seems to be sitting back enjoying or the potential alliance between them, although they are allied in a number of metros around the country. They seem to be sitting back enjoying the disarray of the competition, Moonshot Pact or Rainbow Coalition, call it what you will. Is this what we can anticipate into the future or uh, are you your base case is it still that the ANC EFF uh, are likely to win the national election next year well several points about that one is look uh, we don't know what the election result will be but I think that's what they will be aiming at but 
the point is that a national coalition uh, between EFF and ANC, I think, is a very different animal than these local ones at level of Port Elizabeth or Trani or wherever. Um, to be quite frank, I, don't, I think people have got used to the notion that this can happen at local government level. And after all, you're talking about sewage and about road maintenance and things like that. But the sight of uh, Julius Malema and possibly others from EFF in a cabinet, I think that creates a market panic, uh, which is quite, quite different uh, from what goes on at local level. So I'm not at all sure that there is a viable ANC EFF government which can last at all long. I think it would create ripples of such unease and upset in the rest of the country and indeed internationally. But I'm not sure that you could have a viable, stable government uh, composed of those two. But we shall see. Uh, at the moment, it does look like they're moving in that direction. So I don't think the ANC have made their final decisions on that. And the opposition that don't seem to be able to get their act together? Well, look, the problem about the opposition is that they should have started this so-called moonshot. I wish they wouldn't use that phrase. Uh, they should have started this a year or more before they did. It's a very difficult, complicated thing to do. It requires a great deal of political finesse and hand-holding and smoothing out all the difficulties with other parties and so on. Uh, you can't just rush at it. It, it won't work. And uh, the, You can see that it's been meeting some rough water uh, with some people saying they won't have anything to do with it and so on which should not have happened that way. But, look, I think the sharp end of it is the DA's alliance with the IFP in KwaZulu-Natal, because that is working, and it's working quite well, and it has the potential to do tremendous damage to the ANC nationally and provincially. And you can see the ANC are extremely worried about that. Which is why they've uh, done what they've done in the uh, So I think you can see the potential for this sort of thing just from that. But we haven't really seen it looking very promising outside of KZN. It would appear then, to bringing it all together, that the election in 2024 might be a little too early for um, displacing of the ANC or the ANC and its uh, and its alliance partners, but in provincial areas, particularly KZN and perhaps uh, Gauteng, there's a distinct possibility that there could be changes in government there. I think that's right. But, uh, you know, we, we have to wait and see. We don't know. Look, so much is going to depend on turnout. Um, and clearly, you know, Fikile and Balula said, you know, we could go down to 30%. Um, <laughs> if enough people stay away, then uh, on the whole, the DA voters tend to turn out better than ANC voters. And that, of course, inflates the value of their vote if that happens. So we don't know. But I mean, you know, Nigeria has just had a national election with a turnout of 27%. Um, you know, this is by no means unknown in Africa. And we are falling down to that very low level that we've seen in other African countries. And I, I do expect turnout to fall again. Uh, at the election, but we just don't know by how much. R.W. Johnson, South Africa's foremost political scientist and analyst, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 